Hello. Uh, well, I believe that most of you know that uh, this is in honor of um, the Marx Revival, the book that uh, Marcello edited, and um, there are many distinguished contributors. I was asked to write on, on Marx and ecology, or on ecology, and uh, the revival of, of, of Marx's views on ecology and, and ecological Marxism, the whole question of Marx and the earth. And if you, if you think back to the, the rise of the environmental movement in the 1950s, it really arose in the 1950s uh, um, at the leaders, uh, with, with scientists as the, as the leaders in protests against uh, above ground nuclear testing. And then, and then it took off in the 1960s and 70s, beginning with uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring and uh, the environmental movement uh, became quite massive. And de during these uh, early years in the 1960s and 70s, it was generally understood on the left among Marxists, socialists in general, that um, Marxism was, was ecological, had ecological elements to it. Everyone knew that Marx had made marginal comments in his texts uh, about ecological issues. And there um, was no real contradiction initially between um, Marxism and the environment. It was, it was generally believed that Marx wrote before the modern ecological crisis, so you couldn't have expected him to have said very much. But nonetheless, um, Marx and, and Marxist thought was integrated into the environmental movement. For example, and there are many examples because, because socialists played a leading role in, in the uh, early stages of the environmental movement. But you can, if you looked at Barry Commoner's works like the Closing Circle, uh, the, it, um, and, and his book on energy, they both refer favorably to Marx on the environment. And that was generally the view at the time. And there were major works being produced by uh, Marxists on, on the environment in the 1970s. But something changed in the 1980s. And um, this first response was, uh, was uh, sort of set aside. And in the 1980s, especially the late 1980s, remember Gorbachev had come into power in the Soviet Union, uh, Chernobyl in, in uh, 1986, and it, it became uh, the general notion that Marxism was anti-environmental and uh, that it was Promethean and that Marx himself was a Promethean and anti-ecological thinker in many ways. This, this became the prominent view even among the left. So if you look at maybe the most distinguished scholarship on the subject in the late 1980s, you have James O'Connor's, uh, uh, James O'Connor uh, led um, in the formation of the journal Capitalism, Nature, Socialism. And in 1988, when it, it started off, uh, he wrote, uh, Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, a theoretical introduction. I, I became associated with Capitalism, no, Nature, Socialism shortly afterwards. And that was in 1988, uh, two, years, um, two years after Chernobyl, um, one year um, before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And and then um, even more prominent in many ways, at, at least initially, was Ted Benton's Marxism and Natural Limits, which came out in 1989 in New Left Review, same year as the fall of Berlin Wall. And uh, it um, argued that Marx in many ways was, was inferior to Malthus from an ecological perspective, because while well, Malthus had dealt with natural limits, Marx had not, and that Marx was a Promethean thinker. And what was happening at this time is that eco-socialism arose 
to prominence in the late 1980s in a view that, uh, a view that distanced itself from Marx, coming from prominent Marxist thinkers like uh, Benton and, and, um, and uh, Joel Covell and James O'Connor, but, but distancing themselves from Marx. And the, the general view was, well, we had to create a, a, a red-green perspective that was somewhat eclectic because the argument was that what Marx had offered was, was an analysis of labor, but that we had to take our notion of ecology from the mainstream green movement and then um, uh, merge the two together in a sort of hybrid fashion. So the, the criticisms of Marx on the ecological front uh, were, were quite strong and uh, claimed that it was fundamentally flawed. Uh, but these were socialists and the Marxists who were working on these problems. And um, as I said, I was um, on the board of uh, Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, while this was going on, I, I was also researching it in my own way. But what happened was that uh, the, the uh, criticisms of Marxism didn't seem to hold water. There were, there were all sorts of problems with them. And some of us started to look back at, at Marx's own work. And uh, I, I did, um, in the mid 1980s, I was asked to write a piece for a German dictionary and look, started looking back to uh, the deep structure of Marx's analysis uh, with respect to materialism and ecology. And um, in 1999, uh, Paul Burkett wrote Marx and Nature, which explained that, that ecology and nature was really integrated into Marx's value theory. Uh, in, in quite a uh, quite definitive work, and and Burkett and I had been working together. We were both on the board of Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, and uh, in that same year, I wrote um, my article, Marx's Theory of Metabolic Rift, uh, based on my understanding of the of um, Marx's ecology in that area, his theory of metabolic rift. And the following year, I published Marx's Ecology, which was a much broader work, which um, was meant to uh, accompany, complement uh, uh, Burkett's work, because he, he dealt with the value theory, and I dealt with Marx's materialism, going back all the way to Marx's do doctoral dissertation and uh, moving forward, trying to understand how did Marx's ecological critique, which was so powerful, uh, arise? And, uh, and um, I had decided it arose out of his materialism and that Marxists had lost sight of what Mar materialism actually meant for Marx. So this uh, created what we call um, second stage or, or second generation eco-socialism. Uh, 10 years after the, after the first um, stage, eco-socialism really came to prominence. Uh, we, we came out with a second stage eco-socialism, which was more ecological Marxist. It, it went back to the foundations of Marxist analysis, Marx's analysis and Engels's analysis and, and, um, and reconstructed our idea of what Marx's materialism was and how it had formed ecology. And this became very influential all over the world and is still um, um, be growing in its, its influence. And the reason is um, that the reason that has been so influential is because only in Marx's analysis, uh, and um, I'm, I'm including classical Marxism, uh, I'm, I mean Engels as well and, and uh, the theorists who came out of this, but it's only in Marx's analysis that you have a critique of the mode of production of capitalism of, uh, that, that um, is both an economic critique and an ecological critique, basically two sides of the, of the same coin, a dialectical perspective which combines the two. And so allows us to understand 
the, the social contradictions and, and uh, the ecological contradictions as dialectically interrelated. There is no other uh, analysis that comes anywhere near this, anywhere um, outside of, of um, the tradition that grew out of Marx. And we, um, we started talking about third stage eco-socialism as a shorthand for the unification of eco-socialism around praxis uh, based on these kinds of concepts in this critique. So um, before I get into the details on this, I want to say, answer the question well, that keeps on being asked, uh, why was Marx's ecology lost? And um, it wasn't entirely lost, but, but uh, it, it's, it's true Marx developed these ecological views and um, you didn't see that much in, in Marxism, uh, in Marxist theory in, in say, Western Europe and, and so on, and, and, or in the uh, Soviet Union. What happened um, to these ecological um, views? Why weren't they properly transmitted? Why wasn't it part of the Second International, for example? And uh, Rosen Luxemburg, uh, once said that Marx in his scientific creation has outstripped us as a party of fighters. And she says that the working class movement, she said the working class movement was faced with certain challenges, certain obstacles that uh, governed its, its practice. But as, as uh, the historical conditions develop and uh, new contradictions arise, uh, new challenges for the working class movement, it will rediscover elements of, of Marx's science that have been left behind. And I think that's a good way of understanding the, the um, fact that the ecology wasn't front and center within the working class movement itself. But there was also an intellectual problem. One, if, you, in, if you look back to uh, George Lukacs's history and class consciousness, in, in the early 1920s, in his footnote six, his famous footnote six, um, he, um, he has a, a short paragraph where he challenges Engels's conception of the dialectics of nature and says the dialectics um, and questions the, whether dialectics uh, uh, can be fully um, applied to the natural well, realm as, as Engels suggested. And actually, Lukács never, never uh, abandoned the dialectics of nature. If you look later in his book, he talks about the validity of the notion of a merely objective dialectics of nature, or merely objective dialectics, the um, objective referring to the natural realm, as opposed to subjective dialectics. And he, he, he basically argued dialectics is only fully developed in the historical and social realm, but there is a kind of a hierarchy and dialectics can also be applied in a lesser way uh, to nature. But any, at any rate, um, the footnote six became the basis of, of uh, what uh, became the Western Marxist philosophical tradition, which really started off with the notion that the dialectics can't be applied to nature. It can only apply to society and history. When I studied critical theory, the first thing that you learned in the class, the very first thing, practically the first sentence was that the dialectics doesn't apply to nature. And that became a fundamental, the fundamental premise of Western Marxism, which then separated it off with, from natural science, which it's conceived as positivistic and mechanistic and, um, and, and uh, Marxism became simply a social science. Um, and uh, so that was one of the problems that uh, developed. The other one was in the Soviet Union itself. The Soviet Union had the, the um, leading ecological figures in the world. They had the most advanced ecological science and the most advanced ecological, ecological practice in the 1920s and up through the early 30s in the, in the world. But there was a problem, um, the, the major ecological thinkers, most of them who were associated with Nikolai Bukharin, uh, were all 
were all uh, executed or, or died in prison in the purges. They were targeted and in the Stalin era. And so that, you know, that tended to inhibit the ideas. Um, ideas don't um, develop very well if you, you kill off the people who are, who are promoting them. And uh, Soviet, in the Soviet Union, um, dialectics became more mechanical and we lost that tradition. There was a kind of a revival of some of that in the late Soviet period, but, um, but still it was, it was a great tragedy. There was a sort of a second foundation of, of Marxist ecology within, uh, within the uh, sciences. So although Marxists weren't paying attention, Marxists were mostly in the social sciences and weren't paying attention what, what was going on in the uh, sciences and the natural sciences. But uh, Marxist ideas continued to develop in the, in the natural sciences, particularly in Britain, uh, the, um, where um, they'd been influenced by the early thought in the Soviet Union, the Marxists and Marxist scientists in Britain, and uh, carried forward that tradition even after it was purged. But, um, but um, many uh, Marxist thinkers basically uh, cast that out, saying that Marxism had nothing to do with natural science. So Marxism was hindered by this, um, and the, um, the ecological ideas were developed but didn't have uh, a broad following within Marxism uh, because what ecological ideas were going forward were mainly going forward in the, within Marxism in the natural sciences. Anyway, let me um, talk a little bit about Marx's views himself, because that's really the point. Um, the, uh, the important thing is to understand that Marx was a materialist, and his materialism started uh, with science. So in, in a Marxist day, you know, coming out of the Enlightenment, enlightenment and the whole development of, of science, the... Um, there was a materialist conception of nature. And that's carried through to our, our own day that um, science was rooted in materialism. And by that, it meant that you approach things from a, a material or a physical basis. You uh, had um, you rejected religious ide uh, idealist and teleological explanations. And um, you subscribe to an evolutionary perspective, a broad evolutionary perspective that nature can be explained in its own terms. So Marx came out of this, um, this materialist conception of nature, which was part of the enlightenment. He actually did his doctoral dissertation on the philosophy of nature of, of, um, of the ancient materialist um, Epicurus. And uh, this was, was fundamental to Marx's view, but what Marx did, what he contributed originally, and Engels emphasizes this in his, his speech at Marx's grave, what Marx contributed was a materialist conception of history to go along with the materialist conception of nature. And if you look at the beginning of the German ideology, the, um, it starts off by saying, this was fundamental that, uh, that um, well, it defines human beings in terms of their corporeal organization. That is their physical relation to nature. So that's a connection to the material world. And then out of that, Marx develops the conception of the mode of production. And then from there, his whole critique of political economy and so on. But you can't understand the materials conception of history fully in Marx's terms, and you, unless you recognize that it's all connected to the materials conception of nature, which was basically an ecological stream in Marx's thought. So you can't, if you read Capital, you, if you're attentive to it, you will find the con materialist conception of nature or you'll find natural science appearing on practically every page. We've been trained to not look at it. And of course, a lot of this is in footnotes and so on, but we've been tr trained to ignore all of that because Marxism is a, is a social science. So he's just playing away, playing around with metaphors or something, but that's not true. Uh, he was um, developing 
a materialist view. And to put it in different terms, uh, Terry Eagleton once wrote, referred to Marx's wager. And Eagleton said, what if an idea of reason could be generated up from the body itself, rather than the body incorporated into a reason which is already in place? What if it were possible in a breathtaking wager to retrace one's steps and reconceptualize everything, ethics, history, politics, rationality, from a bodily foundation? Well, Marx did that. He started with human corporeal organization, which um, it's, that actually is not sufficient to explain his foundation because it was tied to the whole materialist conception of nature and the natural world. But Marx was providing a, a revolutionary materialist standpoint that um, if, we, if we leave out nature, if we leave out human corporeal organization existence, then we lose sight of the materialism and we lose sight of, of uh, much of Marx's analysis and all of his ecology. So his most important intervention in this respect, uh, his most important development, and, and really there is there's a great deal we could say about Marx's ecology in, in a lot of different dimensions. And, and actually Marxist theorists have been developing this um, all over the world and expanding the, the theory and applying it to um, praxis. But Marx's uh, analysis um, really can be seen in terms of the concept of metabolism, which was introduced in the early 19th century and um, and um, the uh, Marx took it up from Roland Daniels, a friend of his, who wrote um, *Microcosmos*, a book on a, a book about basically sy systems ecology. It had a systems ecology view in in a way early on, uh, and there was only one person that read it, and that was Karl Marx, because Ro Daniels died. Um, he died as a result of, um, of being in, placed in prison. And Marx, um, Marx dedicated the philosophy, uh, <laughs> the poverty of philosophy to Daniels. But Marx picked up the concept of metabolism from Daniels and later and from Liebig's uh, chemistry and other places. And he introduced a concept of social metabolism where production was actually the labor process and production were the social metabolism between uh, human beings in nature. So he said labor is, first of all, a process between man and nature, a process by which man through his own actions mediates, regulates, and controls his metabolism between himself and nature. And this became fundamental view where the, the economics in Marx is tied to the ecology, to, the, to natural conditions through the concept of social metabolism, where we can just call it metabolism, but the, the um, Marx also introduced the notion of the universal metabolism of nature. So he's, he argued that uh, ecological contradictions arose when, um, when the social metabolism, the alienated social metabolism of capitalism came in conflict with the universal metabolism of nature. And then you had an irreparable rift in the interdependent process of social metabolism or a metabolic rift um, that represented ecological crisis because human beings were destroying the basis of their own social metabolism. And there you get a really powerful critique, ecological critique that doesn't exist anywhere else. And Marx had the most, uh, the most uh, revolutionary conception of sustainability ever developed, even to our time. He said, he said uh, no one owns the earth. Not even all the people um, in all the countries of the, earth, of the world own the earth. They only uh, hold it in trust as bona patris familias, good heads of the household. And he talked about the need to, to to preserve, protect the earth for the chain of human generations, which is our sustainability concept. That, that's what sustainability means. If it means anything at all, it means, it means um, uh, protecting the earth, um, sustaining the earth 
intergenerationally. And uh, he, he developed that more clearly and more powerfully than anybody in the 19th century, maybe even up to our time. He argued that the, the metabolic rift was actually um, due to the same processes that created capitalism so that the expropriation of the land, the robbery, that it was a robbery and a rift. It was the, the robbery of, of, um, of, of the land, the expropriation of the land, the expropriation of nature, the expropriation of human bodies that um, uh, led to, um, that leads to um, the ecological rift or the metabolic rift. That's very much a part of his argument. The whole discussion of, prim of so-called primitive accumulation that Marxist theorists have been involved in for ages is, is very much askew because Marx always said so-called primitive accumulation, or he, he kept on saying it because it wasn't accumulation for him. As he said, the whole section explains that it's not accumulation, it's expropriation, it's robbery. It was, and that was what brought capitalism into being and made exploitation possible. So on this basis, we can also, with the metabolic rift theory and focusing on ex expropriation as well as exploitation, we can also understand phenomena of social reproduction. We can understand uh, the development of racial capitalism. And I think that this, we, you know, the, um, the theory of metabolic rift and Marxist ecology actually allows us to integrate Marxism in uh, across um, in all of its uh, dimensions and, um, and to basically integrate or uh, dialectically interface with, with other traditions. I also more recently in 2020 wrote my book, The Return of Nature, which explained how um, a lot of this uh, went forward and created the modern ecological movement. So you have to understand that the concept of metabolism in Marx's day was the primary ecological concept. And that the, the concept of ecosystem, which gives us our modern sense of ecology was built on the basis of the concept of metabolism. And the, the, um, the leading um, uh, scientists and biologists, zoologists in Britain in the late 19th century, uh, Ray Lancaster was a close friend of Marx and he was the leading ecological critic of the time and his student, and he was a socialist, a Fabian type socialist, and his student, um, Arthur Tansley, be became, yeah, was also a Fabian type socialist who embraced a materialist approach to ecology and introduced um, the ecosystem concept uh, as um, based on, on the kinds of foundations that Marx and others had laid and in a context of, of, of a, a critique of ecological racism. So there's a very dense history here and it leads all the way up to the, to the development of the ecological movement itself. And um, so what we're, we're rediscovering is, is um, the depths of Marxian ecology, the Marxian critique. And it's no, it's no accident that a lot of this was shoved aside because um, the Marxian critique has never been in favor in, in capitalist society. And um, we have to constantly uh, unearth our critique uh, what was what was produced by earlier generations? Because the system makes uh, takes uh, all <laughs> takes every effort it can to um, to bury um, the the fundamental critique of the capitalist system, and this is uh, a case in point. My my most recent book is coming out shortly. Is capitalism in the Anthropocene? And all of this work is not um, about simply unearthing Marx's views. It's about uh, using them to deal with our present planetary crisis. And there's an enormous amount of, of work that's coming out in that respect using these foundations. Thank you.